Hello, everybody, again. So we are diving into the conversations as of uh, now. And we are zooming into impact investing, uh, which is a relatively new concept uh, for the last decade in the world, not only in Turkey. And uh, as it is a new concept, it's, it's really a challenge to act first, to, to be the first investor, to be the first mover. And it's actually entrepreneurial. And in that context, the government is playing a, a, a crucial role here. I think the government is the biggest uh, entrepreneur to make it happen when it comes to a new concept to be realized. And Nick, uh, we are so grateful to have you here today. You made, made all this journey to be with us today here. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, so much for being here, for making yourself available. When we look into your history, we see that you have acted as a member of parliament for 14 years and then as a minister for nine years. You were responsible for uh, the youth, for climate change, industry, and then you were uh, also in the cabinet office and led the reforms uh, to digitalize the government in the UK. These are really huge jobs. But most importantly, you were the minister when the social investment movement was uh, has started in the UK. Actually, you are the you are the one who made it happen at that time. You were in the government. So my first question is, uh, how how did the impact investing uh, movement start in you in the UK? Well, Shafak, thank you so much for uh, inviting me, and thank you for your leadership and for bringing us. Uh, together, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I chair GSG Impact. Uh, for those of you who don't know GSG Impact, we're a global movement, uh, active in now 50 countries around the world. Uh, in all of those countries, we have national partners like EYKD that are trying to create an enabling environment, a better environment for impact investment to flow. And so I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity uh, for us to learn from Turkey and for Turkey to learn from the rest of the world. That's the value of the network. So that's, that's why I, 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 I'm here. So the answer to your question is how it started, uh, Shafak, uh, comes to your main point about the role of government. Um, the government I was part of was led by David Cameron and we explicitly decided to go about s trying to build a new market, social investment money that sought to combine financial return with positive, measured uh, social impact. And we believe that was possible uh, because of our partnership uh, with allies in the private sector who said, this money is here um, and we want to work with the government to create this market. And the thinking of the Prime Minister, David Cameron, who, who gave me the mandate, and it was a personal mandate from him, I had 100% support from uh, the Prime Minister, and that, that mattered, was, look, government's important, but government doesn't have all the answers. And the future has got to be about more effective collaboration between the public and the private sector. And if we can mobilize private capital that is motivated by the right things, then we should do so. And that was, that was the job he gave me. And it matters because, as you say, government is a catalyst. And the signals that government sends are important. And so, sitting here today, listening to the message from your president, listening to your minister, having a private meeting with the minister, it's very clear that you have political support here uh, in Turkey for this movement. And the lesson from the UK is that matters. Yes, the support of the government is crucial. Indeed, but uh, we also have to uh, have the market evolved. So how, how did you mobilize the private sector? We are, as, as Turkey, we are now at that st stage to, to try to mobilize the private capital and to uh, expand the ecosystem 
Um, how did you do that? How did you put the catalytic capital yeah. into we the needed, market? We, we needed the government and the prime minister to believe that the capital was available. And so our, uh, our important partner was Sir Ronald Cohen, uh, a very prominent figure from the capital markets who was very convincing in saying to the Prime Minister, this money is available. This money w is there to be moved. You need to do certain things as a government, but the money is there. So that's very important, having champions in the private sector, in the capital markets, to give that reassurance was very important. And then we took, we took three decisive steps. We created two new institutions uh, with, with balance sheets to deploy capital what we call catalytic capital. So these were institutions were designed to encourage and inspire and mobilize other institutions to invest alongside. So we created a, an organization that's now called uh, Better Society Capital, uh, and we persuaded the four biggest banks in the country to be shareholders in that, and we capitalized it with $600 million. Um, it was far too big for the market, and we did that deliberately to send a signal to the market saying, we're serious about this. Um, we, we then intervened to try and make some funding available to help build a pipeline of investable opportunities, impact opportunities, so that needed some capacity building. Uh, and then critically, as you've done here, uh, Shafak, we've, we sent a signal that we were open to innovation in how public services were delivered. So we created the conditions for impact bonds, what we call outcome-based commissioning, a new approach to commissioning public services where we opened up space for social investors and social entrepreneurs to come in and help us deliver better services in areas where the state wasn't doing a very good job, difficult areas that carried a big social cost. We said, why don't we innovate there? What we're doing is not good enough. And we created the space for uh, uh, organization to earn revenue that could be investable and through uh, uh, outcome-based contracting and social impact bonds. I think those were the three things that really made the most difference. What does it add up to? Uh, we've seen $10 billion of social investment flow into supporting better social outcomes in the UK that did not exist before we started. And, and we have mainstream institutional investment that now uh, and publicly listed vehicles that are all about social investment so we made lots of mistakes right <laughs> but we got more right than wrong which is the art in politics so as the state you created a social investment market which was its 10 billion pounds at that time so these three steps were there uh, were they uh, in a sequence or were, were you just realizing these uh, steps at the same time. For instance, in Turkey, we have start with the last step to create example mechanisms. In, in our case, it's the SIB we have created. Was it in a sequence in, in the UK? In practice, we did most of the hard work in uh, three years, four years. So we did it all at the same time. Because we wanted to convey some energy and some excitement and some momentum, we wanted movement. So we, we obviously had to do quite a lot of planning and there was some sequencing, but it happened, it all happened within a space of three or four years. And at what stage uh, has GSG come into the picture? And why? How? Why? 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 So GSG emerged from this. Um, so uh, the UK had the G8 presidency, it was the G8 then, uh, in 2013. And David Cameron, who was then Prime Minister, uh, was so pleased with what we'd done on social investment in the UK that he put it on the agenda of the G8. And he asked Ronnie Cohen to set up a task force under the umbrella of the G8 to encourage social investment in the other G8 countries. So the task force was set up. And that task force has effectively become GSG. And eight countries have become 50 countries. And so this has become a really global uh, movement and we have, I think, 20 countries uh, in the queue to join this community, uh, this, this federation, this, this, this network. So it tells you something 
ladies and gentlemen, about the movement and the momentum in support of this, this system change and this different way of thinking that we're arguing for. And the audience here might be curious about what uh, GSG exactly does. What's, what's GSG's role, function, and how does it differ from other uh, non-governmental or non-profit uh, organizations who are active in impact investing. For instance, there is GENE, the Global Impact Investing Network in New York. There is EVPA, now Impact Europe in Brussels, and then AVPN, the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network. These are all networks all around the world who are all advocating for impact investing. What's, what's the difference in GSG? Well, the common ground is important as well. So we're all pushing in the same direction. We're all pushing for the language we use is a, is a transformative shift in resources towards activity that has a positive measured uh, 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 impact. Uh, um, you know, there are differences. GSG Impact, our, our organization, we have a very strong policy hub at the heart of what we do. We, we, we try and stay at the front of the thinking uh, on this, in not least so we can support yeah, EYDK and other national partners in terms of your advocacy and in terms of your knowledge uh, sharing. Um, but ultimately, while others have sort of regional networks, we have a, glo we have a global network. Uh, and we also uh, invest time and are going to invest more time engaging with governments. So other, other organizations tend to focus on their members who are investors. We're trying to build ecosystems of change in uh, uh, 50 countries around the world and that means bringing together not just investors but those looking for investment policy makers regulators intermediaries the whole ecosystem of change that has to be involved so we don't just focus on one group we focus on trying to bring everyone together to have that conversation and to build that know-how and that confidence to, 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 to move forward and create the tools that people can use yeah, actually, that's how we call ourselves at EYDK as well. We see EYDK as a round table, uh, you know, arm's length to any institution and in individual, but having everybody at the table, sitting at the table, uh, to, to collaborate and to participate uh, this this conversation. So from what you're saying, I collect the words, the keywords like for GSG, networking, partnerships, policy recommendations or policy making and perhaps connection to the global world, the, this global and innovation, network. And innovation, and Shafak. innovation. So, so we've, we, we, we've created new organizations like the Education Outcomes Fund that is looking to build uh, education outcome bonds and funds around the world. We have, we, we believe very strongly in impact transparency. We want to work towards a world in which companies and, and governments report on their impact because we want impact to become a, a factor in every investment uh, decision and we're delighted by the leadership that Turkey has shown but we ultimately dream and that dream is becoming reality that we shouldn't just have impact transparency we should seek to try and put a monetary value on impact so that it really does become part of the investment calculation and the judgment we make on companies and so we set up the international foundation for the valuation of impact which is at, with harvard university developing those methodologies so we're always trying to stay you know at the at the forefront of thinking and thinking about what's needed next while trying to encourage the, exactly these kind of conversations around the world what you're saying is very important because i mentioned in my uh, welcome welcome speech there's some perception when we are talking about impact investing. There's a wrong perception that, uh, you know, when you're doing an impact investment, there's no profit in it. So what you're saying is you're putting a value, you're monetizing the value of impact. And at the same time, you're, uh, you do have the impact transparency agenda to make it more transparent so that you can uh, measure and manage impact. Uh, what what would what what would you say is is uh, impact investing uh, can impact investing make money make profit? So I'd say two things: one short term, one long term. So longer term, 
I, I genuinely believe, I mean, I've, I think I'm a pragmatist, not a, a dreamer. Uh, 14 years in politics <laughs> um, has made me a pragmatist. I do think we are moving towards a world of impact transparency, and we have to, because part of the problem we've got, the problems we've created, is there is insufficient accountability for impact. It's not part of the decision-making process. We have to change that, and that's happening. It's happening in Turkey, it's happening around uh, the world where companies will be more accountable for their impact. And that will mean that, you know, whether we want to invest in that company, whether we want to buy things from that company, whether we want to work for that company, I think increasingly, particularly a younger generation, will be making judgments based on brands. And that brand judgment will be increasingly based on the impact that that company has on society and the, and, and the planet. So I think we are moving towards that future, and if we can put a value on impact, then it becomes part of the, 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 the calculation of uh, in investment decisions and will shape return and will become a factor in shaping return. But I think in the very short term, I can only speak from my direct experience. So having set up a big social investment institution in the UK, uh, Better Society Capital, with the four biggest banks as shareholders, they wanted to see a return. And they've seen a return. Now it's concessional capital, so the return is modest, but that's what it was set out to be. I also chair an invest, uh, impact investment company listed in London that focuses on uh, net zero climate change technologies. And uh, you know, we deliver high private equity returns to our investors. We are, but we are mission driven, but we deliver high uh, investment returns. I work with an impact company whose mission is to end energy poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. We connect citizens in sub-Saharan Africa to electricity, uh, and we have created uh, $350 million of equity value in that business, doing something really hard that is very, very impactful. So I recognize that investors have different uh, return expectations, but in my experience, whether it's low return expectation or high expectation, in my direct lived experience, I can see examples where those expectations have been met. And that's important because we do, if we're going to move this money, if we're going to, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, the situation is there's never going to be enough public money to meet the challenges that we face in Turkey or globally. There's more than enough private money. $270 trillion is our global wealth at this moment in time, of which $2 trillion now on a, is invested for impact or through instruments that have some link to impact. And that two trillion, two trillion dollars is the number that we have got to, to grow. But that's a very small percentage of the 270 uh, trillion dollars that is our accumulated global wealth. So to move the money in the real world, uh, we have to create investment opportunities that deliver on the return expectations of investors. As they evolve, and they will change, they may change, but we have to create opportunities that meet the investors where they are. I believe Turkey, Turkey is going to move to, into that space uh, earlier than, sooner than expected. As the legislation has passed in December 2023 uh, to adopt the ISSB standards, which means by September, the publicly listed companies have to do this, uh, have to use these ISSB standards uh, in their sustainability reporting. And that is just the top of the pyramid, you know, it comes down. If you think that uh, Tur Turkey is doing 70% of its uh, exports to EU countries, that means that the SMEs in the end are subject to this um, law and regulation, set of regulations. So by uh, September, uh, Turkey will be very busy to, <laughs> to make, make this happen. It will be hard, it's a challenge at the same time because we may not be ready, the markets, the companies may not be ready, but we have to do it because we have committed. We are committed and we have a law, so we have to use the standards and sometimes, you know, uh, you just develop when you're out of your comfort zone. It's, we, I can see that uh, our country will come out of the comfort zone 
as of uh, September 2024. We are going to observe this, uh, observe this all together. So when we zoom into Turkey, how do you see, um, you know, what are your highlights? How do you see Turkey from there? And what do you think uh, our weaknesses or strengths are? What's the potential here? I'm enormously... I'm enormously excited by what's happening in Turkey, and, and that's you know a large part of why I'm here. You know, I chair an organisation that's in 50 uh, countries, but I, I was very keen to support this event and you because um, I'm really excited by what's happening uh, here because you're moving very fast, and I can see the stars aligning because you have political support, you have superb leadership. Um, you know, uh, EYDK is done amazing things in a very short period of time. You know, I can see the first social impact bond. I can, I'm just even having coffee beforehand, hearing about new funds coming to market in Turkey, supported by the World Bank and, and, the, and the private sector. Conversation we had with the minister was, was very encouraging. I can feel the energy. I can see this, the law, which will be a game changer in terms of requiring disclosure of companies. That's going to be uh, uh, the start of a journey and it's going to be a, a, a game changer. So I can see evidence of real leadership, real uh, enthusiasm. Of course, Turkey doesn't sit in isolation. Turkey looks east, Turkey looks west. People look at Turkey for inspiration and for leadership. What Turkey does matters. And, and so to, uh, you know, to see the leadership here, to see the collaboration, to see the political support, to feel the momentum, is enormously exciting um, because I know that our network will learn a great deal from Turkey and I hope that through the network we can bring whatever expertise and knowledge and experience from success and failure, because you learn most from failure, right? <laughs> is, is, is something that we can bring to the table, uh, Shafat. But I, I, wish, I wish everyone in this room success and uh, persistence and courage uh, in, in, in what you're doing to change a mindset and a system that is very powerful. Um, but we have to change it because money needs to flow into uh, positive uh, impacts in the interests of people and planet. So do you think Tur Turkey will shine like a star? Hmm? So do you think Turkey, Turkey will shine like a star? I, 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 think, I think Turkey is one of the brightest stars in our sky. Uh, at the moment, I've, I would say that with love and respect for all the other countries. But, but uh, um, no, you, you learn, you learn in you learn in politics and in life. You know, it's always about people, and it's always about leadership. And when you can see the stars aligning, uh, as they seem to be doing in Turkey, in terms of government understanding, support, growing interest from a very powerful private sector, you see the scale of Turkey. You see your, the leadership that you've put together. I feel um, that things are going to happen. And the world divides between talkers and doers. And, and I sense that Turkey is going to be doing. Thank you so much for your nice words. Mindful of time, I think we need to uh, leave the platform now. We are grateful uh, for, to have you here. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank Thanks a lot.